Good evening. It's good to see everyone. We are still doing great chapters, and the chapter that I'm working on with you this evening that we're going to study is from 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. I want us to really pay attention to certain special words as we go through this chapter. I believe uh, that this will open up some understanding that we, at least I, had not always had in reference to this chapter. So Peter starts out, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your minds by way of reminder. Okay, what do you think of when you think of the word stir up? Do what? Like stirring bee. Like oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Getting a beehive going. Okay. That, that would be one possibility. Okay. What else? <laughs> stirring a big pot. Okay. Irritate uh, or, uh, or something on that order. Now, here's, here's what I ran into. When I looked the word up, it literally means... Awaken, like you would, you know, stir somebody in bed. You'd you'd shake them. You would awaken them. And so apparently Peter is concerned with all that's going on amongst these scattered Christians that, that they could be asleep, not in the physical sense, but that they're not tuned in to what might be going on. So he says... I've written you before, that's first Peter, and I'm writing you now. And in both of these letters, my intent is to awaken you. And then he says, uh, furthermore, by way of reminder. And one of Peter's big things as he goes through, not always using exactly that word, but one thing that he really highlights is this concept of reminding, causing people to think about things that they ought to think about. We'll actually see it again in this very chapter. Not that word, but one that has essentially the same meaning. He's going to use it again. So reminder, uh, do you sometimes have to be awakened, so to speak, by a reminder? That ever happened to you? I can tell you this incident happened a number of years ago on a Wednesday night. I was the Bible class teacher in the auditorium. Richard has his class, I don't know, B1, I guess. Maybe in those days, B3. I don't know. He was in the B wing somewhere. And uh, Teresa and I are on our way you know, to the building. I get a phone call. It's Andy Dulaney. He says, are you coming? I said, yeah, we're on our way now. And then I go, bingo. See, all my grown-up years, we started Wednesday evening at 7.30. And so it was, it was only five after seven. I was doing great, except for one thing. We started seven. Uh, so sometimes you have to kind of wake up, don't you? <laughs> sometimes you need to be reminded. Now, in eight years, that's the only time that happened, so I'm, I'm thankful for that. But still, uh, it, it happens for all of us. So here's Peter, and he sure wants to call to their memory, to waken them up and to help them remember certain things that are very important. And he goes on to explain that that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. All right, now, I think we need to see a word here. And we love to focus on this word when we're looking at Acts chapter 2, for example, and also Math, uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 16 but we need to see it here. It is the, just the word and. And is a coordinate conjunction that gives equal weight to what's on either side. Okay, that being the case, I want us to go back and look at what he says. 
that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. Now go back to chapter 1, same epistle, and listen to what Peter has already said about the prophets as he writes to these scattered Christians. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. By the way, marginal reading for the word uh, interpretation is origin. And the point is that the prophets did not think this up in their own minds. Instead, they spoke as, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And we've talked about that on other occasions. But the Spirit is like the wind in their sails. Imagine a sailboat doesn't go anywhere if there's no wind. In the same way here, there'd be no writing in reference to Scripture if it weren't for the Holy Spirit being the wind in their sails. So we now know that uh, because of this and, we know first that the prophets, the prophets spoke, spoke God's word. But what's on the other side of the and? The apostles. Yes, the apostles. They're on the other side of the word. Now, let's look at a few other passages. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, for instance, beginning at verse 7. And here the apostle Paul is explaining that no, he didn't per se come with... Uh, excellent speech. He wasn't really impressive. He wasn't a great orator uh, in their minds, and he just accepted that. Okay, not a great orator. Fine. But listen to him now as you pick up in verse 7 of of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But, as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God." For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So now what do we know? Well, with the, because of the and, we know that the apostles also spoke God's word. That's exactly what they did. They, they both did it. Now, to confirm that Peter believes that, go down in the same Second Peter chapter 3, look at the chapter more deeply, uh, where we pick up particularly... In verse 15, we'll come back to it later uh, if time permits. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught, untable, unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of Scripture. Paul wrote Scripture. How did he do it? Same way the, the prophets did. So Peter starts off with a very, very important reminder that they need to be mindful of the things that have been revealed. 
by the prophets. That's one part of it. Now you read the book of Acts and tell me that you can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and never bring up the prophets. I don't believe you can do it. Not if you're doing it effectively. You bring up the prophets because they foretold that this was coming. And then also, of course, the, the apostles. All right. Now, having set this stage this way, Peter goes immediately to what I call the taunting. And listen to him in verse 3 as he talks about it. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. Okay, scoffers. If you wanted to substitute a word there, you'd put the word mock. Mockers. They mocked. And, it, and now, all of a sudden, what comes to your mind? If you're like me, you've got to think about Peter uh, as he sees the Lord on the cross. And how'd they treat him? They mocked him. Uh, they, they said, you know, if you're a son of God, come on down from there. And uh, they didn't just say it once. They said it you know, several times. Come down if you're really the son of God. That's one of their great emphases as they're talking. Well, he says in the last days. Now, that's interesting because Peter thinks of the last days as being the last age of God dealing with man. How do I know? Acts chapter 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. See, is what the Hebrews writer says. The Apostle Peter says it by referring back to who? To the prophet Joel, who in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, spoke about the last days. And Peter says, this is that. This is it. We're here. We've arrived. We're in the last days. So he says in the last days, mockers will come. And what are they going to do? They're going to walk according to their own lust. They want, they're going to live according to their desire. Whatever they want, they're going to have it. Uh, that's the way they're going to approach life. And then, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, uh, Wayne Jackson in his New Testament commentary makes an interesting observation. We've got some brethren that are not as sharp as these scoffers. Uh, because we've got brethren that are not real sure about creation. But the scoffers were. And uh, the scoffers believed in, in a continuous historical approach. That is, it's always been the same. It's always been just like it is right now. And that lets me know that God is not sending his son. If he's going to send him, he'd been here a long time ago. That's their basic argument that they are making. They are, they're taunting uh, these Christians with that idea. Now watch. For this they willfully forget. Have you ever intentionally forgotten something? Well, I, I suppose there's a good way we could do that. Somebody hurts us, and, uh, and we just intentionally lay it aside. I'm not going to think about it anymore. I'm not going to bring it up. I'm going to put that away. That's, that would be a good thing. But these folks are intentionally ignoring what they know. Oh, what did they know? Well, listen to him as he goes on. They will for, willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. What's he describing there? The creation. They know, but they're willfully forgetting that this, this whole thing came about by the spoken word of God. And then he goes on. By which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. Uh-oh. Has everything gone on the same since creation? When... when the mountain stood out of the waters? No. It hadn't always gone on that way, has it? In the days of Noah, the mountains were once again submerged under the water. You say, once again? Yeah. If you read closely in Genesis chapter 1, guess what? <laughs> the, everything was covered. The whole earth was covered in water, Genesis chapter 1, until God spoke. 
and brought it out. But after the creation, it once more was all underwater. Now, one day if I get a chance to, and I have been blessed on one occasion to go visit in the home of Wayne Jackson, I got, I got a question for him because he said that he believes that there were potentially billions of people that died in the flood. Well, potential is an interesting word, but, but I'd like to know where, where are you coming up with the idea? And probably it's the number of years and the number of children that some of these had. That, that would be my guess, but I don't know. Never had thought about it that way. But I know this, everybody except Noah and his family died. That I know for a fact. So everything did not keep on going like it had always been. Instead, there was a massive change, the change that occurred at the flood. So that is the taunting, if you would. Now, the next thing we want to look at that Peter looks at is the timing. Listen to him, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. I think we know what preserved means. How does the earth stand today? God sustains it. That's how it stands today. If it weren't for God, the earth would just cease to function. You, you got to wonder if God turned his back with, with all the all the various uh, planets just fall out of the sky. I don't know. They might. No, because he's the one who keeps them there. He sustains that. So that's, that's one part of the preservation. Uh, and they're preserved by what? By the same word. Isn't that interesting? God spoke the, the creation into existence, and God continues to speak to maintain the world as is. Keep it going. That's a very, very interesting point. And then reserved. Uh, if you want to translate that very, very straight, you'd say treasured. Or you could use this word, laid up. And guess what? That exact word is found in Matthew 6, verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. There it is, right there. So what he's saying is that God has laid everything up until a certain day. That's the timing. When he gets ready, it's going to come about. And that's what Peter is underscoring for us. Till the day of, the, of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And that word perdition here would be better translated destruction. That's the marginal reading in the New King James, and that's really a better word here. So don't think that folks are going to get away with it. It's not going to happen that way. It is not. God has reserved them. He's laid them up. And one day, he's going to judge them and they will receive their destruction at that point in time, according to Peter. Now, look at verse 8. But beloved, now watch this, do not forget. Remember earlier we said, remember? Now he said, do not forget. It's interesting, it's basically the same word with just a little, little twist. There's a not there. You know, uh, uh, do not forget, do not, do not fail to remember, is the way you and I might put it. Do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Now, folks have abused that passage to no end. Uh, they love to take that and say, well, see there, you know, the, there were a thousand, a thousand years for every day of creation. No, there weren't. Uh, and, and I know that specifically because the Hebrew language is so uh, careful and emphatic about some things. When you get to Exodus chapter 20, it talks about God made the world in six days. And he uses a specific word that when a number is attached to it, it means literal days. 
24-hour periods. And by the way, just, just as an interesting sidelight, Genesis 1 says, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Does that not sound like 24 hours to you? You know, wouldn't you love to have a, a, an evening that lasted 500 years? I mean, that's ridiculous. It's just, it's just ridiculous. It does not fit. So what is he saying here? He's saying time doesn't mean anything to God. You notice that you don't hear the words in the beginning until God starts the world. And then anything, anything other than that you find before the foundation of the world, not uh, a certain year or a certain day. Or it doesn't, it doesn't do that. God doesn't doesn't think that way. He's not bound by time. And if you want to put it a different way, we usually say he's eternal. He's not bound by time. So to him, a, the passage of a day is just like the passage of a thousand years. It just doesn't matter. It's, it's all the same you know, to him because he's eternal. And by the way, one day we will be too. And then time, time will not matter to us either. Uh, but for right now, we are human and we are bound uh, by, you know, by time. So verse 9, as he continues to talk about the timing, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. A couple of things I think are very important for us to see here. Uh, first of all, slack. What, what does that mean? He's not slack. S slow? Okay. That's not wrong. Anybody else? Another idea? Another maybe synonym or something like it? You ever talk about, you slackered? What do you mean when you say you slackered? Not doing what you're supposed to be doing, right? You know, you were supposed to clean out yesterday. You mean it isn't done now? Hadn't been finished yet? Yeah. I see you grinning, Richard. And at my house, I, I have to grin because Teresa's always got at least one thing that I should have done yesterday. And she's not mean about it. I just should have. You know, that's the, that's the truth about it. Okay, God's not that way. God didn't forget. He didn't fail to do what he planned to do. He's not a slacker. In any regard. But what? Now listen to this. He wants all men to come to repentance. Now I want you to try somehow to harmonize this with the Calvinistic teaching that says God predestined some people to be lost. Can you harmonize those two? I'm having a lot of trouble harmonizing those two. If God really wants some people to be lost, what's he waiting for? Because if he'd come right now, I'm sure some folks would be lost. You know, and that would have been true any time, really, if you think about it. Uh, there always are those that do not listen to or obey the will of God. So this passage is pretty strong on the fact that no... God didn't predestine some to be lost. He wants, he desires all men to be saved. And by the way, Peter's not the only one who says that. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says the same thing. Who have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And by the way, the word men there is the word anthropos, which means all of mankind. It's not... Uh, a nair or gune. A nair is the male of the species. Gune is the female of the species. It's not either one, it's both. God wants everybody to be saved, and, the, and that is why the timing is being held. That's why God hasn't, his son hasn't come back yet, because it's not time. He still wants to give people time. To change. Now, as we go on, we're going to pick up on a different word. It's going to be the word long suffering. And if you think about God in biblical history and you think about long suffering, 
You got to think about the Canaanites. That's what uh, God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. What about the, the Egyptians? Same idea, Genesis 15. How long did God put up with them? At, at least 400 years. The truth is, he'd been put up with them before, but he put up with them another 400 years uh, to go along with the others. So the timing is based on God's desire to save all. That's what, why he is waiting and thus we come to what, what I describe as, uh, as the tenacity. And uh, I skip verse 10. Let me throw 10 in there. Uh, you know, my typist every now and then misses something. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be Burned up. Okay. The timing. When's it coming? Well, don't know. And in fact, listen to how he puts it. It's going to be a surprise. And that's the easiest way to describe that is to talk about uh, a thief. If you knew a thief was coming, would you let them take your stuff? No. Their whole idea is they, they... Seize on it when you're not looking for them, when you're not aware that they're coming. Well, the Lord is not trying to catch people unaware, but like the thief, he will surprise some people. And if you wanted to here, you could tie in you know, Matthew 25, 1 through 13, where you've got two different types of people waiting for the Lord to come back. The ten virgins all are there. Guess what? He says, then shall the kingdom of heaven be like. Well, in Matthew, kingdom of heaven is a church. So then the church will be like. So everybody in the church is waiting for the Lord to come back. But some are not prepared. Some are going to be surprised. Not because he wants to surprise them, but they're not going to be ready when he comes. Others are going to be prepared. So this surprise element, it's unfortunate, but it's true. And by the way, it's, it's a, a thing that is cited more than once in Scripture. He describes here the destruction of this present world. I, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into this in depth tonight, but there is nothing within Scripture that would cause me to believe that this earth will be refurbished. It's nothing going to be here to refurbish. You know, you do not refurbish a house that is burned to the ground. You might rebuild. You might build another one, but you're not going to refurbish the old one. It's not going to happen. Well, he's describing here how that everything that we see and know, and by the way, even some things that we don't know. I don't know about all the elements. I can't see the oxygen in there, but it's all going to be gone. It's all going to be burned up. That's the idea that is set forth here. Everything in it, even the works that are in it, will be burned up. Therefore, now we're going into the tenacity. You know this is coming. You know the Lord's coming. You don't know when He's coming. Therefore, and remember the old thing, I'll quote it often, but it's a reminder for me too. Whenever you see therefore, you ask, what's it there for? <laughs> okay, here's what it's there for. It's, it's referring back to the fact that we don't know when the Lord's coming back. And so what does he say? Verse 11, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Since I don't know when the Lord is coming back, what should I do? Always live to be ready. Uh, I don't tell this very often. We've had several young men in this congregation that are they're part of ROTC in high school. Well, I was in ROTC in high school in El Paso uh, in my junior year, I decided it was time to get out because I decided I didn't want to be an officer in Vietnam. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but it did to me at the time. 
it made perfectly good sense. So I got out of the ROTC. I did, really didn't want to go down that road. You know, but I was in that. You know what they love to do in, in any kind of military setting? Ron, you've probably experienced this. Surprise inspection. And you know, if they catch you with what your brass is not right or whatever, you're in trouble. You can say, well, we didn't know you were coming. That's the whole point. You're supposed to look this way every day. Period. That's the way it is. You know, you can just about hear the, whatever, lieutenant, captain, whatever, <laughs> colonel. You hope it's not a general. But whatever, you know, you, it's whatever he is or she is, is in this modern era, uh, whatever the case may be, they're going to catch you off guard to see if you're always what you ought to be. So because the Lord is coming at an unexpected time, we need to be ready all the time. We need to live God-like lives all the time. We need to be sure that we are a holy people. Now remember, Peter is, if you would, the apostle of holiness. He talks about the holiness of God all the way back in 1 Peter chapter 1, and where he, he quotes that God says, be you holy as I am holy. Well, God is holy, and we've got to be holy just like him if we're going to be pleasing to him. So then he goes on, looking forward and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolving on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, by the way, uh, the expression new heavens, new heavens, new earth is used in several places in the New Testament. If you read every one of those contexts, I can tell you one thing's going to jump out to, at you. It is invariably a figure of speech. It's figurative language. Uh, and let me see, I mean, one of those references, by the way, is in Revelation, I think, chapter 21. I have to double check. Uh, I had that this afternoon. It's, it's evaporated temporarily from my brain. But uh, if you look at the book of Revelation, it talks about what? It talks about streets of gold so pure you can see through them. Do you really believe that heaven's going to have streets of gold so pure you can see through them? I don't. I believe it's going to be better than that. But how are you going to portray it for me? It's a spiritual place for spiritual people. How are you going to portray for me in words that I'll understand without just using something I'm familiar with? I'm familiar with gold. Now, I've never seen gold so pure you could look through it. But, but you know, I'm familiar with gold. I'm familiar with, uh, you know, diamonds and sapphires and all the other beautiful stones that are in the, in the uh, temple walls, the walls, the walls of heaven. That's what we're really talking about. I'm familiar with all of those things, but I don't believe that's what's going to be in the wall. Now, you, you can call me a heretic if you like, but I think God used language we could grab hold of. New heavens, new earth. What's he saying? A new place to live. For us, heaven and earth, that's it, right? That's what we have. And so new heavens, new earth is a figure, a figure of speech that is used to describe a new place in which to dwell. That's the point, I believe, that he's making. And what we need to gather, I believe, out of it. <clears throat> so then, he goes from the tenacity, the hold on, don't let go. He goes from that to... The teaching. Now I'm going to pick back up and go back just briefly to verses 1 and 2 where he said, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Now skip on down to verse 14 where we left off. Therefore, beloved, Looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation as also our beloved brother Paul, 
according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. You know what I wish we could do with, with brethren who get in a fuss to the point they won't sit down with each other anymore? I wish we could say, you know, you want to look at this story just a little bit? Do you remember Galatians chapter 2? What, what does it say? Paul said he withstood Peter to the face. That does not sound like a pleasant meeting to me. Sounded to me like we got a problem, and they did have, because Peter had violated the very principles that had been laid out in the Jerusalem conference, Acts chapter 15, and guess who was a big player in that conference? Peter. And, of course, another big player was Paul. So when Peter violates the very principles that they all agreed to in the Jerusalem conference in Acts chapter 15, Paul stands into the face, and when you get to 2 Peter, does Peter hold a grudge? No. Beloved brother. That doesn't sound like a grudge to me. My beloved brother. Of course he's beloved. You know what he did? He tried to keep him faithful, true, bring him back to what was right. I think that's only fitting that he, that he would do that. Okay, and then he talks about the wisdom given to him. We already looked at that a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2. You could also see it in uh, Ephesians. Ephesians chapters 2 and 3 both emphasize where he got it from. The mystery that was revealed to him so he could reveal it to other people. Um, Paul received what he did from the Lord through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So then he goes on. We read this a little bit earlier. Uh, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and untable, unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of Scripture. All right, think about this. What, what about... Uh, what Paul had to say, and what about this idea of him being inspired? Well, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, just a minute. Here's Paul writing to the church at Corinth. If I can get my pages to come apart. Uh, verse 2, listen to what he says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now listen to what Paul says. Why? Because he's trying to help you get ready so that you'll be ready when the Lord comes back. So that you'll be what you ought to be. Look at Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Here comes Paul again. Is he interested in their eternal well-being? I don't think there's any doubting it. Any denying it. Pick up at verse 14. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Paul says, don't want my work to be empty. How's he going to keep it from happening? He's encouraging them to do what's right. And if you think about what Peter's saying, he's stirring them up as well through his teaching, just like Paul did. And what's the goal of everybody? Let's go to heaven. Let's all go to heaven together. Well, then he closes out, verses 17 and 18. Uh, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall among, uh, from your own steadfastness. By the way, if you can't fall, why write about it? Now, I literally, one day, and Teresa can tell you this story, we were on our way home uh, to, to get lunch, and I turned on a, a local preacher for a denomination. He read verses like this, and he said, Now, see, that's just a hypothetical. It, it couldn't happen. And I go, Huh? You know, what did he write it for? If, it's just, if it couldn't happen, that's not a reasonable hypothetical. To me, a hypothetical is something that might happen. If you step on the gas instead of the brakes, you might hit something. You know, that really might happen. It's hypothetical, I hope. I don't plan to do that, but, you know, I don't think this is hypothetical here. Lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge 
of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Now, if you flip back to chapter 1, when he talks about the virtues that you need to grow in in order to know that you're saved, what's the leader? Add to your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge. you got to have knowledge to remain true. Peter has taught so that they will know what they need to do so that they will be prepared when the Lord comes back. Unexpectedly, yes, but they'll be prepared. And so for them, it won't be a bad sudden coming. I hope you have gained from chapter 3 of 2 Peter. I, I love this chapter. It's a, it is rich.